I want to talk about our lost and stolen heritage of states' rights. I want to make it clear that I uh, am not encouraging anyone to uh, take what may be a premature and ill-considered action in regard to Fort Sumter or, um, or any other federal installation uh, at the present time. But I, I do want to talk very straightforwardly about certain um, truths as, as I see them of the American situation. Federalism, we had, we had a couple of years ago a, um, a celebration of the bicentennial of the, of the American Constitution. As far as I know, during that celebration, there was never any mention of republicanism, there was never any mention of federalism, which are the two essential characteristics of the American Constitution. Instead, we had a celebration of multiculturalism and big government. Uh, federalism is the essence of the American system. Federalism implies states' rights. States' rights implies, uh, in order to mean anything, implies in the final analysis a right of secession. The cause of states' rights, to put it very bluntly, is the cause of liberty. I would suggest, uh, as proved by American history. States' rights uh, and liberty have risen uh, and have fallen together. If we had been able to, um, to preserve the original union um, of sovereign states that was founded by our forefathers, there would be no question of the American empire that we have today. Uh, the American empire could not exist, would not exist, if we had preserved the original union uh, of the founding fathers. Uh, but instead, we have this empire which interferes in our uh, local uh, and individual uh, affairs ever more uh, every day. Um, and we find ourselves more and more controlled by a remote power, and we have an empire which um, also uses our resources to meddle in the affairs of distant uh, peoples. The old union was a friendly contract between sovereign states who managed their own affairs and who got together for purposes of defense. Uh, they also enjoyed complete free trade among themselves. If you recall, the Constitution uh, requires that all uh, taxes be uniform throughout the union. Is often forgotten the Constitution ab absolutely forbids any tax upon exports. Uh, it does allow the Congress to lay a small uh, customs duty uh, upon imports. Uh, this was for the purpose of raising the government's small revenue, and it was considered a, a reasonably fair tax. Uh, there was, it was not designed to protect uh, industry or to manipulate industry in any way. In fact, in the Philadelphia Convention, a proposal to allow the Congress to uh, uh, adopt tariffs to, to protect industry was uh, uh, thrown out. Uh, nevertheless, the idea was brought up by General Hamilton not long after the government was founded, uh, like so many other evil uh, schemes. And, uh, but it took almost 40 years for it to begin to become an established policy. Oh, ever, ever since I got the bifocals, I've developed an unnatural relationship with my materials. Uh, what the United States meant to our forefathers was that happy union. Uh, Basil Gildersleeve, the, uh, probably the greatest scholar ever produced by America, a great classicist, was born here in Charleston and was a Confederate soldier. And he remarked after the war that the... Um, the war between the states was a conflict over grammar. It was a question of whether, which was correct, the United States are or the United States is. And if you, uh, we, well, we have been using the wrong grammar for a long time now. And if you're using the wrong grammar, you can't get anything correct. It certainly... Uh, did not, uh, the, the uh, happy old union did not mean a government um, 
that dictated the use of parking spaces in every public and private building in every town uh, in the country. Uh, I did not mean a government in which, uh, as at Waco, in which women and children were incinerated by uh, a bunch of brutal mercenaries uh, posing as a as a federal police force uh, unknown to the Constitution. Uh, I did not mean, as in the case of Kuwait, uh, that Americans were obligated to put an Oriental despot back um, upon his throne. And I guarantee you, if George Washington had heard of any of those things, uh, he would have reached for his sword to take care of the, uh, of the perpetrators. He would not have considered it the American, uh, the fulfillment uh, of the American uh, system. The founding fathers knew, they were very much aware that Republican societies such as they, they had um, erected were fragile. Uh, they were all, always in danger of disintegration or degeneration into something uh, less uh, desirable. Uh, one of the ways in which they expected to avoid this was through federalism, uh, the dispersal um, of power uh, among the states. Uh, so they hoped. Uh, but self-government represented um, for the founding fathers not just a, a democratic uh, majority voting anything it wanted, but what self-government meant was that the community was superior to the rulers. For the first time uh, in history, uh, so they thought, the rulers became uh, the delegates of the community rather than uh, as in an empire like the one from which they had seceded, uh, the community and the people being the uh, uh, subjects of, of, of the government. Heretofore in society, <clears throat> um, the people, the community had existed for the support and the gratification of those who uh, ruled. This was the definition of an empire. Republican America, on the other hand, was to be governed by the communities that made it up. In an empire, the government... Um, operates uh, according to the interests, the ideas, even the whims of the rulers uh, who can doubt that the American government is today an empire. Republicanism, as it was understood by the founders, on the other hand, consists essentially in the inviability uh, of the community. The community takes precedence over the government. The purpose of the government is to serve the community. Uh, and political activity is directed towards the well-being of the people. In an empire, political activity is direct is uh, management-oriented. It is directed towards managing the people for the benefit of their government, their rulers. Um, who can doubt that the American government is today an empire uh, by that uh, definition? And the evidence mounts every day that the American people no longer think of the government uh, as theirs, but as hostile, manipulative, unjust, distant, and unresponsive. An empire contains not citizens, but subjects. Interchangeable persons who have no intrinsic value um, except as taxpayers and cannon fodder uh, for the empire. If the governors of an empire decide that it's uh, more expedient for them to placate criminals rather than to punish criminals, uh, then they are, uh, may very well turn over people's communities and schools to uh, the criminals, as has already happened in this country, um, and uh, in and violate the first rule of government, which is the preservation of order. In an empire, people's culture may be changed by governmental fiat into a trumped-up multiculturalism. 
the religion, maybe it's act. And the surest sign that we now live under an empire is the fact that the ruling class does not live um, under the rules that they make. Uh, one of the hallmarks of republicanism was that the office holders were temporary. They returned to the ranks of the people to live under the benefits or the burdens of the laws that they had made. Uh, our rulers no longer do that. Our children are blessed, theirs are not. Uh, if they happen to get kicked out of office, they go to work uh, for foreign governments and corporations uh, uh, selling out uh, the birthright of America. And uh, this is very evident in the case of war and in international relations also. A republic goes to war uh, for the benefit of its own interests uh, as they are perceived. An empire goes to war because that is one of the things that empires do. That is one of the things that irresponsible rulers do. So that in an empire, you can have a situation where warfare and foreign policy reflects the vagaries of mind of the rulers and not the interests of the um, society. Uh, you can have, for instance, a ruler who can, who can proclaim that it is the duty of Americans to uh, propagate global democracy and a new world order uh, around the world, whatever the cost may be to their own uh, blood and treasure. And who can doubt, if, uh, if I'm correct in the way I'm defining things, that America is now an empire. By contrast, the old union, the true union, uh, Thomas Jefferson remarked in his first inaugural address <clears throat> uh, that in many ways Americans uh, were very happily situated in 1800. And he asked rhetorically, uh, Jefferson said, <clears throat> what more is necessary to make us a happy and prosperous people? Still one thing more, he said, fellow citizens, a wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another, uh, which shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread that it has earned. This is the sum of good government. This is the sum of good government. Uh, rather far away uh, we are from that today, um, I would think. And Jefferson went on to talk about how do you preserve this sum of good government and the things that you must do or uh, not do in order to maintain it. And he suggested we must preserve the right of election, although he said not a word about the sacred two-party system. Preserve equal justice under the law. Rely upon the militia uh, rather than a peacetime standing army. By all means, avoid government debt. Preserve freedom of speech, of religion, the right of trial by jury. Avoid entangling alliances with foreign powers. And Jefferson said, most important, to the preservation of the sum of good government is the support of the state governments in all of their rights as the most competent administrations for our domestic concerns and the surest bulwarks of our liberties. The surest bulwarks of our liberties. Uh, there is a very large, sophistical literature which tells us that Jefferson was really not very serious about states' rights. Uh, that was an incidental thing. Uh, what he was really interested in was equality uh, or some other things. Um, this is not, you know, this is not true. Uh, it was well understood at the time, and for a generation or two after that, the main point of Jefferson's platform uh, in American public life was states' rights. He was the author of the Kentucky Resolution, after all, which outlined that uh, a state may nullify an unconstitutional federal law, that the state is the judge of the constitutionality. And in fact, late in his life, well, people denied that Jefferson had written the Kentucky Resolution. So after he had died, until his son-in-law produced the, uh, the original draft, which was even stronger than uh, uh, what was adopted. 
uh, but late in his life, Jefferson very specifically recommended that this be done again against uh, that Virginia nullify the, uh, the federal internal improvements legislation. Uh, almost exactly the same thing that, that Calhoun in South Carolina did uh, about 10 years later. But it was understood that at his, uh, the principles of 98 were the, uh, uh, of the Kentucky resolutions were the, uh, the main point of Jefferson's public position. John C. Calhoun said, speaking in exactly the same tradition a few years later, the question is in truth between the people of the states and the Supreme Court. We contend that the great conservative principle of our system is in the people of the states as parties to the Constitutional Compact. And our opponents contend that it is in the Supreme Court. Without a full practical recognition of the rights and sovereignty of the states, our, our liberty must perish. States' rights will be found in all cases of difficulty and danger to be the only conservative principle in our system, the only one that can oppose an effective check to power. And by a conservative principle, Calhoun means not um, in terms of left or right, liberal or conservative, but he means that, that which conserves, that which... Uh, saves, preserves the essence of the system. Uh, I don't really need to um, to dwell on what a contrast that is with the present situation. But R.S. McDonald, our greatest um, constitutional scholar, says uh, not long ago, political scientists and historians are in agreement that federalism is the greatest contribution of the founding fathers to the science of government. It is also the only feature of the Constitution that has been successfully exported that can be employed to protect liberty elsewhere in the world. Yet, what we invented and others imitate no longer exists on its native shore. The very simple proposition that our founding fathers understood and that indeed underscored everything that they did, that the only way to preserve liberty is to check governmental power. The only way to check governmental power is to divide and disperse it. Many of the founders hoped that the federal system would do this, um, would allow expansion of the country without centralization. Uh, we have to, and this was the whole point of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, we have to face the fact that this has failed, it did not work. Uh, that was their main advance. It was also hoped that the different branches of the federal government, the division of powers between the executive, the judicial, and the uh, legislature, would uh, form, uh, perform the purpose of checks um, and balances. We should face the fact that this does not work. It ceased to work a long time ago. There is no serious conflict of power between the three branches of the federal government. The Supreme Court does not check the president or the Congress. The Supreme Court checks us. All of the branches of the federal government are directed towards checking, checking the states and the people of the states. The federal government will never check itself. As Calhoun says again, power can only be opposed by power. Federalism may constitute uh, the only hope, and there is no genuine federalism unless it is backed up by, ultimately by the right of secession. Otherwise, it has no uh, no final uh, force. And interestingly, of course, the, rec the recognition of the right of secession uh, generally um, obviates its use uh, because if the, uh, the ruling powers um, really have to acknowledge that people can leave, can withdraw, then they have every incentive to behave themselves uh, that they do not have otherwise. Uh, 
Federalism is talked about a great deal. There's a whole shelf of books uh, in the library about it. Uh, it's one of the least understood, it seems to me, uh, of all the political phenomena, both theoretically and practically. Um, and we should be fair, beware of the many phony forms that are floating around. Uh, in true federalism, means that power comes from the, the roots um, up. Uh, and if people in Washington are talking about letting the states uh, of the Union do this or that, that is not federalism. That's just another form of federal uh, administration. True federalism is when the states say to the federal government, you may not do this. Your limits have been reached. Stop. Uh, that is genuine federalism. Forget uh, any of the rest of it. If we agree with the uh, most political philosophers that there is a, uh, in every society, um, a sovereign somewhere, a final authority, an ultimate power, then that sheds light, sheds light on uh, the concept of states' rights. If there is a sovereign, uh, which I, I think is a good, an accurate conception in every society somewhere, there is a power uh, that has the ultimate say-so when everything else is said and done. When you reach the bottom uh, line, somebody has the last word. The sovereign can, can delegate powers, as the states did to the federal government. Uh, but it cannot uh, uh, give them uh, up. Uh, Americans have always agreed that the people are sovereign. That is to say... Uh, America is a republican system and not a monarchy or an aristocracy. The term people is uh, not self-defining, however. What do we mean by the people? A mere 51% electoral majority will not work when you're talking about the sovereign because there's nothing ultimate about that. It, it can change uh, in uh, 24 hours. Uh, and frequently does. Uh, nor when we talk about the people, do we mean, I think, that if a million Chinese wait ashore in California uh, and outvote everybody else, then the people have spoken. Um, I do not think that is what we mean by the people. In the American system, plainly and simply, the people means only one thing. It can mean only one thing in a constitutional sense. It means the people of the states as living historical corporate communities. The whole of the Constitution rests upon this. Uh, the Constitution exists because of its, its acceptance, its ratification by the people of the states. Uh, the states are said to be indestructible. and They are represented in the Senate right, and in the Electoral College to some degree in the House of Representatives. In fact, there's no, there is no point in the Constitution of the United States uh, where a, a simple majority of the people rules on anything. Uh, there is no point in which uh, the states are not represented um, as such. Uh, it is only the, uh, by reference to the people of the states that we can say in America that the final sovereign has spoken on anything. And it is still quite evident that Three-fourths of the states uh, who may amend the Constitution may do anything. Three-fourths of the states may abolish the Supreme Court, may abolish the income tax, uh, may indeed dissolve the union, uh, if they so agree. Um, there is nothing to prevent that. So I'm suggesting that that power uh, still exists in the American system. Uh, it is certainly in abeyance, but it is still there. Uh, what uh, is lacking is, of course, the will um, to exercise it. As James Madison says, the meaning of the Constitution is to be sought not in the opinions or intentions um, of the body which planned and pro proposed it, but in those of the state conventions where it received all the authority which it possesses. 
Uh, we have, in fact, as Calhoun suggested, have allowed the sovereign power um, to be exercised by the Supreme Court. Calhoun said the choice was either the states uh, or the Supreme Court. If you, if somebody, either one of those two things is going to make the final decision, we have allowed it to be done by the Supreme Court. Uh, five black robed justices may go into the closet and commune with the gods uh, and come out and tell us what we must do and what and we must obey, uh, no matter how absurd their interpretation is uh, in the light of the Constitution, no matter how uh, in conflict their interpretation is with the will of the people. This is what we have allowed. But the fundamental of the American system is still there. Uh, each state still retains its sovereign constitution making power um, if it will exercise. Uh, as the states did in the American Revolution uh, by throwing off the, um, the royal um, authority and assuming their own sovereignty uh, and making their own constitutions and ratifying the Constitution of the United States, which was, in effect, making it a part of their Constitution. Historical uh, and constitutional understanding. Um, a little commentary on the, um, on, on the history of South Carolina, which in many respects is typical of all of the states, which I know. Uh, Calhoun, as Calhoun referred to, our gallant little state. In 1719, the Lord's proprietors were the owners of Carolina. They became high-headed. Uh, they attempted to abolish the assembly, that, the elected assembly that the South Carolinians had enjoyed. Uh, they attempted to uh, gross the lands which the South Carolinians had won in Indian Wars by their own efforts. The people of South Carolina, acting through their legislature, which they had chosen through a governor, which they chose themselves and through their own militia, threw the proprietors out. and an exercise of their sovereignty. Uh, they subsequently gave their allegiance to the, um, to the British uh, crown. Uh, one historian has commentated um, on this. It was a thoroughly orthodox English revolution seeking to conserve, not to destroy, led by substantial citizens for the definite purpose of correcting their grievances. Or as, um, as Mel Bradford, who most of you know, or, or know of, used to say, uh, about the American Revolution, it was not, it was not a revolution made, but a revolution averted. In 1776, the people of South Carolina, acting through their legislature, their own chosen governor, their militia, ejected the royal governor, made their own constitution, and assumed their own Sovereignty, and this was before the Declaration of Independence, uh, months before the Declaration of Independence or any notion of the Union of the Colonies. Uh, this was true of all of the states. Five years before the Articles of Confederation, the state of South Carolina was sovereign and exercising all sovereign powers. Uh, war, diplomacy, um, taxation, the execution of felons, exercising every sovereign power. Uh, and as was being described at the Historical Society this evening, um, about a week before uh, the Declaration of Independence in June of 1776, uh, the South Carolina forces at Fort Moultrie repulsed the British fleet and established, not only proclaimed, but established their independence um, and self-government. Uh, there were a few uh, military experts who had been sent down by the Continental Congress who informed Colonel Moultrie that his Palmetto Log Fort was not defensible and it should be abandoned. Uh, Colonel Moultrie told them to uh, uh, get lost and went about his business. 
an early example of federal um, interference. And of course, he, he was perfectly right and won the battle. Uh, and we might think uh, just a little about the later attempt to exercise the same sovereignty um, in the middle of the 19th century, which was a good deal less successful, uh, and met with a much heavier opposition. We usually think of Fort Sumter in terms of the, uh, the first incident of the war and the surrender, but of course Fort Sumter was occupied by the South uh, for all the rest of the war, and it was bombarded uh, by fleet uh, and by land, mercilessly, uh, for um, almost four years. It was literally reduced to rubble, although it was never given up, never abandoned, uh, until it was taken from the uh, uh, rear. <clears throat> and while this was going on, the, um, the Army also, uh, including uh, using some of the largest artillery uh, in the world, amused itself by lobbying uh, shells into Charleston, the lower part of the city that they could reach, um, causing numerous civilian casualties and great destruction of property. Uh, Leviathan can be very nasty when he is frustrated uh, and thwarted. Age rights, I'm suggesting, is fundamental to the idea of liberty. Uh, but uh, also, what is not quite the same thing, fundamental uh, to the idea of democracy or republicanism or government of the people or whatever you wish to call it, which Americans presumably believe in. Government rests upon the consent of the government, as Mr. Rockwell said at the opening of this uh, meeting. This is the key part uh, of the Declaration of Independence and not the little decorative bit about uh, equality. The consent of the government. Government is legitimate just to the extent that it rests upon consent. That is to say, the people accede to the government. The opposite of to accede is to secede, to withdraw, to withdraw consent. The right of self-government ultimately rests on the right to withdraw consent from an oppressive government. In the final analysis, that is the only thing that can restrain uh, a repressive government. And our, our forefathers did not regard the American Revolution as a one-time event, uh, which all of our sort of folklore Federalist, nationalist folklore suggests that the American Revolution had uh, occurred one time. Uh, then the people gave their consent to the government, and this uh, the government is forever. Um, not at all. The consent of the governed was a recurrent or an ongoing process. Thomas Jefferson referred specifically to the secession of the colonies from Great Britain. This is the first political use of the term. Americans invented the idea of political secession. Americans invented it. Uh, they brought it forward. And very clearly, if you read Jefferson uh, and the other better of the founders, what they want to preserve is not the union, but the principle of self-government. And Jefferson is perfectly willing to entertain that probably in the future, in fact, America will break up. That's all right. Um, the point is not the union. The point is self-government. And whatever is the best way to preserve self-government, whether it's under one union or two confederacies or more, uh, that is the principle to be preserved, not the government uh, and the union in itself. At, as uh, Mr. Ostrowski uh, uh, described this morning, uh, with this whole notion of states' rights and the, the original nature of the American government. There's no doubt about this to any honest mind, despite the fact that we have a vast literature built up to sort of justify the, uh, the nationalist interpretation. Um, and the question of state sovereignty is not altered by the fact that there are now 50 states uh, in the Union. 
the Constitution very wisely probably provided that new states may be admitted to the Union. The Union is expandable. The Congress may admit new states to the Union. But the Congress does not create a state, nor the federal government does not create a state. A state creates itself. A state can only be created by the act of a sovereign people, not by law of the federal government. A people adopt their own constitution. They incorporate themselves into a political community. Uh, the federal government may admit them to the Union or not, but it does not create uh, a state. If you believe in uh, that the people are sovereign and give their consent to the government. And this is just as true of uh, Idaho as of South Carolina. Our forefathers understood this perfectly. Um, the United States has always spoken of in the plural until the Civil War. The Bill of Rights was understood as a restriction on the federal government, despite what lies and semantics you may get from the courts and the, the uh, scholars these days. This is absolutely clear. Read the language. In the Bill of Rights, Congress shall make no law. Congress shall make no law. Uh, all rights not delegated are reserved to the states and the people. What could be uh, clearer than that? Uh, and it was also, they were also clear about the understanding of American history. When the government had first begun, General Hamilton had come along with all sorts of schemes that were bent on stretching the federal government further than it was supposed to go. General Hamilton was defeated by Jefferson and his friends in 1800 and sent home. And that idea was supposed to have been put to rest. This is the way people understood the history uh, until the Civil War. And this was certainly neither a, uh, certainly not just a Southern conception. Tocqueville, the great French observer, says in his book in the 1830s, the Union was formed by the voluntary agreement of the states, and these, in uniting together, have not forfeited their nationality, nor have they been reduced to the condition of one and the same people. If one of the states chose to withdraw its name from the contract, it would be difficult to disprove its right to do so. And Tocqueville was only stating what everybody understood as a simple fact um, at the time. Um, Lord Acton, great British historian of liberty, writes to General Lee shortly after the war. The defeat of the Appomattox is a greater setback for the cause of constitutional liberty than Waterloo was a victory. Waterloo was a victory for constitutional liberty because it put the end to an expanding empire. Appomattox was a loss for constitutional liberty because it established an empire. Acton goes on to say of all checks on power, federalism has been the most efficacious and the most congenial. The theory which gave to the people of the states the same right of last resort against Washington as against Great Britain possessed an independent force of its own. Northern statesmen of great authority maintained it. Its treatment by Calhoun and by Stevens forms an essential constituent of the progress of democratic thinking uh, as much so as Rousseau or Jefferson. You have to resort to a great deal of semantics, legalisms, or outright lying and distortion in order to, to refute that proposition. So, very politically incorrect term, states' rights. States' rights have certainly fallen into disuse. Uh, this is not because, I, I suggest, this is not because they are unsound in history, not because they are unsound in constitutional law, not because they are under, unsound in political philosophy and democratic theory, They've fallen into disuse for a couple of reasons. For one, 
uh, they were suppressed by force in the last century. Force can settle questions of power, but it cannot settle questions of right or wrong. And it's also true that the trend of civilization for the past century or more has been centralization or consolidation. Uh, read the Founding Fathers and you see one of their great concerns is what they call consolidation, the centralization of power. This is something to be feared. Uh, it was a danger, a temptation, uh, but something to be feared and avoided if at all possible. Kind of consolidation is a great evil of the trend of history has been seemingly for a long time now in favor of consolidation. Uh, we appear to have reached a point um, in history uh, where we have reason to believe that perhaps that trend is coming to an end. Um, all over the Western world, uh, we find an impulse towards the devolution of power, the breakup of large states. Um, I was visited by some people from Ireland not long ago. In Ireland, they've had a, a, a grassroots movement that tries to, has tried to avoid the government machinery completely and reach some, some uh, settlement of their problems. And they came up with a report which very specifically referred to John C. Calhoun uh, and the concurrent majority. And both the government and the press over there went crazy. They couldn't, what, what is this? How can you learn anything from this old slave crap? Uh, but they, you know, they stuck to their guns. It was very clear. Scotland, Quebec, anyway, I'm suggesting that we have some reason to believe that the world is changing, that some of the forces of history may be um, <coughs> finally on our side for a while. The uh, period of consolidation may be coming to an end. We may indeed be, have reason to hope for a new flowering of freedom of communities, of individuals, uh, of small states. And after all, we often forget that freedom is the hallmark of Western man. Freedom is what Western civilization is about uh, preeminently, something that our leaders certainly have not uh, observed. Uh, we also have the great advantage of the uh, the Comprehensive wisdom of Austrian economics, uh, now, which our forefathers did not have. So we are not in a bad position in many ways. And if we're going to talk about federalism, we mean the states. Uh, and the states are all that we have. Uh, and I understand that the politicians who run the states are in every respect uh, as despicable as the politicians who run the federal government. Uh, however, they are closer to be reached. Um, the states exist. They are realities. Uh, they are what we've got. And they can, it seems to me, uh, be made uh, use of. It would indeed be a shame and a tragedy if in this period of devolution, Americans did not look back to their ancient uh, honorable founding tradition uh, of states' rights. We don't have to resort to revolution, which is a, a somewhat more drastic step. Um, we do not have to resort to anarchic individualism uh, in, in order to uh, cripple uh, Leviathan. We have the states ready-made. Uh, that can be employed for that purpose if <coughs> Uh, we have the will to do so. So I'm suggesting maybe what we ought to do is go back to our states and uh, begin to work uh, upon the people there with the impulse to govern themselves and concentrate perhaps upon that and, and ignore certain other things that have occupied us. For instance, do we really care whether the Republican Party succeeds or fails? Uh, or do we really care whether uh, um, Newt uh, Kendridge's um, futuristic predictions uh, are fulfilled or not? 
or do we really care whether the Congress cuts the rate of growth in the uh, welfare budget by 1% or 2%? Um, maybe we should think about some other things that we can have some effect on uh, that will make a difference in the long run. Our lost uh, and stolen heritage of states' rights, uh, a, ter a term that was once an everyday term in America, uh, a household word, uh, and yet it is, it is hardly heard, hardly dares be spoken of. If we can do that, uh, if we can really restore the old, the true American Union of self-governing states uh, in place of the present imperial America, uh, that will be a wonderful thing. There's no need to fool ourselves that it will be easy. Uh, it will not be easy. Uh, but we can make a start, and we have made a start. The first step is to free ourselves of the superstition of consolidation, the superstitious belief in a uh, wise and good uh, federal government, and that the um, uh, inevitable trend is always towards more and more centralization. Uh, that is a superstition, a, a falsehood that we have lived under for far, far too long. Um, we have to free ourselves of that superstition and we will make a great step forward. And I tell you that that is what we have been doing this particular weekend. Uh, and the fact that we are doing that is a great step forward in itself.